we are here tonight. I'm just going to get straight, straight to it. I want to have some real talk about what is going on on issue one, the constitutional amendment. We are all working so hard to pass to protect reproductive rights in Ohio. So many of you worked so hard to help collect 710,000 signatures so that we could get past that threshold to qualify for the ballot. You all worked hard to say no in August so that we could fairly get to this vote on November 7th. And of course, early voting has started. It is all happening. We have to be nimble and recognizing what is going on around us. And the way we do that at Red, White, and Blue is by listening to you. And we have been hearing uh, with increasing urgency, asks for help and support in responding to some of the things you all are hearing out there that you know is wrong. You know, it's not quite right. You know, it may be an outright lie, but you're not quite sure the best way to respond because that can be tricky. So we're here to support you in that tonight. We are going to talk about why it's important to address disinformation like this. We are going to talk about what exactly to say so that you can respond to it effectively rather than just feeling, you know, kind of blustered and unsure. Um, and we're going to talk specifically about how best to deploy those arguments. Now, I do want to address one important thing. Some of you might say, well, why, why are we focusing on these, you know, what's coming out of the anti-abortion extremists? Shouldn't we just be trying to get out the vote? The answer is yes and yes. This is a both and state we live in, in Ohio. We need people from across the political spectrum to be with us and voting yes for that, this to get across the finish line. The latest data is telling us that nearly 10% of voters are still undecided. And the, largely that's because of the success the vote no folks are having in sowing confusion. And there's something that the panelists and I were talking about before we got started here tonight that's really important to understand. And it's something that the vote no folks are relying on, which by the way, their entire campaign relies on sowing confusion. They know that the majority of Ohioans are with us. The majority of Ohioans absolutely support reproductive rights. So they have to create confusion. And when people are confused, there's something called status quo bias. If you're not sure if the ballot amendment language is raising, you're not quite sure what it means, or if you've heard something that sounds sort of off and you never quite got it resolved for yourself, you think, oh, well, things seem okay as they are. I'll just vote no. Just keep the status quo. So it's not that you have to be like passionately against us to vote no. We need to make people feel confident and secure in voting yes. And the other thing that happens when we do that, when we support others that we know who are already voting yes, but we make them feel passionate and fired up to combat this disinformation, those no voters become no mobilizers. They become volunteers with all of us. And we need that energy. We need it right now. You know, I mean, these elections in Ohio are hard work. And the way we do this is together as a community supporting each other. So let's use these moments to grow our ranks in this community of support. Okay. So of course, as always, we will be talking here tonight, but then always moving to action. And tonight, what that means is that we are going to be asking you all not just to go, okay, I get it. We need to be confronting this disinformation. Here's what I can say about it. But we need you actually doing it. Like, so we're going to get to the how part too. I am going to ask Jen and others from the Red, White, and Blue Ohio team to drop some links in the chat right now. Many of you are already a part of our campaign to get out the vote through our friend-to-friend -friend networks. We use a web platform called Rally. It takes about 30 seconds to log in and create your account. And what you do is you go in there and you say, who can I take responsibility for in my network to make sure they absolutely vote? And don't tell me that absolutely everyone you know votes. This is 2023. It is an off year election and odd years. Human beings are not programmed to remember that there are elections. So it is important to remind everyone. So you're going to go on there and you're going to match your folks to the voter file. You're going to say, this is who I'm going to take responsibility for. And we have already an action ready to go for you in there that is how to, it is a link directly to all the information you need to simply in plain language terms, bust the stiff's information. And we've got all the language loaded for you there, whether it's gonna be a Facebook post or text or however you reach out to your friends. So we are going to get to that how tonight too. And it's so, so important. Okay, but before we get there, we are gonna start by hearing from three moms, three Ohio moms of Ohio kiddos, 
um, about how dangerous this disinformation really is. You know, red, white, and blue, we don't address anything like just in bureaucratic, technocratic, here are some bullet points terms, right? We talk about why this matters. So we have three moms. Um, I'm so thrilled who have joined us tonight. We have Amy Fogel and we have um, Dr. Elise um, Berlin and Dr. Samantha Wigan. They're all moms and you noted, I said a couple doctors there too with some particular expertise on this issue. But I wanted to ask Amy, um, who's down there in the Dayton area to share with us. She helps lead the Red, Wine and Blue Ohio team. So is working on this day in, day out really has been <laughs> since March. And um, Amy, I want, to sh I want you to share what you have been seeing in your community in terms of disinformation from yard signs to the chatter. Amy has been a really important guiding light on our team in terms of really having her finger on the pulse, talking to volunteers every day and in her own community about the impact disinformation is having on all of us. And every time she speaks, it like recenters me in this work. So Amy, tell us what you're seeing and hearing right now. I think what I'm seeing in my community, and thank you so much for our speakers for joining us. Uh, I just kind of like dawn on me. I am a registered nurse here in Ohio. I love that I have brought together two other providers, physicians in the community and moms. And I think that we are well centered to kind of talk about this type of thing because our history and our background is advocating for patients, advocating for our community and speaking for folks in when they're in positions that they can't speak for themselves. And so, yeah, we got together at Red Wine and Blue and decided that we really needed to take this parental rights disinformation head on because the anti-abortion group is claiming parental rights for themselves. And we know that we want to take care of our kids too. And so I was talking to the team the other day about how we're driving through our community. We have a very prominent Catholic church in our community that has a well-known school that any children on my street go to, a family that teaches there, the streets around my community and in my own street is lined with vote no and it all says parental rights. And I know how I feel being deeply invested in this, being behind the scenes, helping lead the effort in this ballot initiative and knowing how it makes me feel inside, how it twists my stomach up. It makes the, you know, just my heart drop down to my feet. And to think to myself, I have all the tools to know how to combat this and handle this. And I feel really like I'm struggling with it. So how do we come to our community? How do we empower each other, lift each other's voices up and reclaim the parental rights that we know that we are in the right of? Because we know that the Ohio GOP will strip away all of our parental rights to deliver reproductive health care to our children. And particularly for me as a mom, Many of you have heard my story. I had aggressive breast cancer in my 20s. I had lost my father as a small child in an accident. And so I know deeply how family dynamics can change in a day. One phone call, one test, one wrong move, and everything can change. And I know that there is a possibility that I can't be here to care for my children, for my daughter, the entire time that she's growing up. So I need to make sure that I protect her rights, no matter what happens to me, because I want to make sure that if I'm not here, she has agency and autonomy over her own body to chart her own course. And so I am super excited to have um, Dr. Elise Berlin here and Dr. Samantha um, Wigan to talk about how they feel about this issue as being parents, but also for being frontline care providers with um, adolescents and with um, OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine. So I thought I would do a little bit further introduction here. So Dr. Elise Berlin, um, let me, I lost my, my spot here. There we go. Um, you are a professor of pediatrics, a faculty physician at a very large children's hospital in the Division of Adolescent Medicine, and you also founded and direct a contraception clinic for adolescents and young adults, and you serve on several national organizations representing pediatricians and OBGYNs. 
And additionally, we have Dr. Samantha Wigan here, and she is an OBGYN in Ohio and a certified in maternal fetal medicine and also a veteran. So I would love to start with um, Dr. Berlin. If you could just come off mute, I see that you still have your little mute sign there, and tell us what consequences you are seeing when it comes to parents' rights for teens and parents and their families if issue one doesn't pass. Well, hi, everybody. I just am so pleased to be here today. I have been a fan of the work of Red Wine and Blue for a long time, and I was tickled to be invited. So thank you so much. I am a pediatrician. Um, I practice um, a type of pediatrics called adolescent medicine. And so most of my patients are adolescents and young adults. And primarily, I work with young people and their families together. And um, you know, the question of what does this mean to, um, you know, what does issue one mean to adolescents and their families? It's absolutely critical. I can tell you when, um, when the Dobbs decision kind of came down and when we had that um, short term six week, we had briefly a six week ban, um, there was so much confusion. And then the and turned over. And I can tell you, people have been so confused coming into my office, being scared that the government is going to take away their birth control, being scared the government is going to stop their access to life, um, you know, life critical um, medication. And I have just seen so much confusion. So I am really happy to be here today to talk about like, let's cut through the confusion and talk about how issue one really is very respectful of both young people, adults, and parents and families. So we know that um, from many legal experts, the passage of issue one will not impact parental consent laws in Ohio. Most adolescents will, and they want to, and they will involve their parents and their caregivers in this really important decision. No adolescents and families take the decision around a pregnancy lightly. They engage in these decisions in the most thoughtful ways. And the influence of parents and caregivers is among the most important for adolescents. I would not support this issue if I didn't know in my core that this is really what is best for adolescents and their parents, because adolescents and their parents need to have their reproductive choices available to them. And I think that's what it comes down to. Um, if issue one does not pass, the state will be under an extreme ban, most likely, that has no exceptions for the health, the life of the pregnant person, and has no exceptions for rape and incest. These are not the um, choices that we want um, women, adolescents, and families in, Ohio's to, in Ohio to face. We want people to make decisions based on the guidance of their healthcare providers, the best evidence in, that we have in medicine, and to really exercise their full autonomy as human beings within families and communities. So I, I really um, wanted to share with everybody, as a pediatrician, someone who sees you know, children and their families daily, I really can attest that this um, issue one is, is good for young people and their families. I think you bring up a really excellent point of saying that people are really confused. And I think that people have maybe a short-term memory of the fact that we have had the privilege due to folks putting um, forward the injunction that we have had reinstated access to abortion care this whole past year. And so I think people tend to forget that we went through over 80 days in 2022 where there was no access to abortion care past six weeks or which I'm looking forward to talking to um, Dr. Wigan about of the extreme loop, like um, extreme loops that folks had to jump through to be able to get clearance and okay from facilities to get abortions during that ban because the law is so unclear as to what constitutes a life-threatening um, situation for a pregnant person. And so I think a lot of people have forgotten that if we do not pass issue one, it's in the courts right now at the Ohio Supreme Court, they're in oral arguments right now to bringing back one of the most extreme abortion bans in the nation. 
So why do you think, you know, do you see um, patients and families coming in and um, wanting to know if they're going, you know, if they're, is there confusion and why do you think that these tactics are working with them? Well, yes, there absolutely is confusion. You know, I think um, that has been a strategy of the other side is to sow confusion, um, sow lies about what issue one is about. And so I think it's really imperative for us all to speak the truth about what Ohio needs and that we need good medicine. We need people to be able to make the choices between their families and their healthcare providers and themselves that are the best for them. And we don't want legislators making medical decisions for us. You know, that that does not lead to good health outcomes. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Berlin. Dr. Wigan, how are you? I'm thank I'm fine. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Wigan um, as a volunteer during the signature collection phase. And um, we had some opportunities to chat about her work, um, the patients that she sees, and kind of being on the front line throughout this whole entire process as being an OBGYN, and particularly as a maternal uh, fetal medicine specialist, you know, you see people who are coming to you probably at some of their most devastating moments of their life, um, being pregnant, having complications and needing to come to you and kind of the stresses that you must have seen during that time. But I wanted to share with you quickly that you said something to me that has just stuck with me the entire time. And it was that um, people can become so judgmental when it comes to abortion access and tend to make these very knee jerk reactions as to what they think is the cause of needing them. And you said to me that um, not all sex is consensual, not all birth control works, not all mothers are healthy, and not all fetuses are healthy. And that just really stuck with me of the spectrum of what happens when it comes to reproductive health care. So if you could just share with me as, as a mom um, and as a provider, um, why do you support issue one and why do you think this is so critical for your patients? Sure. I could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> I'll try to keep it pretty brief because I think a lot of people um, on the call are passionate. We're all on the same page. Um, so thank you for having me. Like you said, my name is Samantha Wigand. So I'm what's called a maternal fetal medicine specialist. What that means is I am an OBGYN who did an extra three years of fellowship training specifically to take care of pregnant persons um, with high risk conditions. That means either the mom has a high risk condition prior to pregnancy or that develops in pregnancy or the fetus has the condition because I'm the person who reads ultrasound all day and kind of diagnoses fetal, you know, anomalies. Um, and I'm the person on the front line who does help women um, and pregnant persons make decisions regarding their health care when a pregnancy doesn't turn out as they wanted or, you know, um, if things aren't going well. And so why is it important to me as both a mother and a person who takes care exclusively of pregnant persons and their fetuses, this affects both me, my potentially my children, and also my patients as well. You know, I want my children to have the ability to have the breadth and depth of all health care and abortion is health care. And so if my children are in a circumstance where they find themselves um, where not being pregnant is the best choice for them for whatever reason, with the point being kind of like you brought up earlier, that pregnancy is very nuanced. It is not the same in every person. And folks have a tendency to just rely on their own experience, which is human nature. But um, it's really important to realize that not all pregnant situations are the same for all people. And so I want my children to have the opportunity to have the breadth of reproductive health care that I've experienced throughout my life. Um, and I want all my patients to have that. You know, a lot of people don't know what could happen to them and can't imagine it until it happens to them. Um, and I see that every day when I have when something goes wrong, because that's what I specialize is in is when things don't go as you expected. Um, and so to have choice an opportunity to make the decision that makes sense for you, 
your family, because most of my pregnant patients um, are not alone. They have families. Many of them have other children. And to make decisions that make sense for their family unit, depending on their particular circumstances, is so important to me. Um, and, you know, when we had that brief period of time when the ban was in effect, um, that was really hard. It's hard to get access for my patients. And since that time, I still have providers, including OBGYN physicians, calling me when women are in a particular bind, generally because there's something you know gravely wrong with their fetus. And they're confused and they don't realize women can still obtain abortions currently in Ohio. So it's not just, you know, um, everyday folks without medical training, it's OBs in Ohio who are confused about the law and it's other physicians in emergency rooms and in other positions that are confused about the law. And, um, that means that people can't get the healthcare that they need or deserve, even if it's available because of misinformation and confusion. Um, and so, yeah, that's just one part of it. Wow. I mean, I think that that's an excellent point of how insidious the misinformation and disinformation is and how it works its way into every facet of our lives affects everybody down to the healthcare that is delivered to us because of the confusion that is sown by a very loud minority. Um, well, thank you both so much for joining us. I really appreciate your insight. I hope that you can stick around because um, I hope that we're going to have time left over for a little bit of a Q&A, but we really appreciate your insight and your time and thank you so much. And I am going to kick it over to Katie, who's going to take us on to the next portion. Thank you so much to all three of you. That was really powerful. And I just want to emphasize the importance in being grounded in these personal stories as we communicate and being grounded in the values and personal stories that we represent when we communicate. Because it's not just about talking points or having a statistic. We're going to give you all of the talking points and all the things to say. And we've got them as, as simple and straightforward. And you're going to be able to share it and spread it widely because I know you guys have been asking for that. Um, but if we just went straight to that, we wouldn't ground ourselves in the way that is going to make us be the most effective messengers possible. And yes, I'm already seeing some good questions in the chat and taking notes. Um, okay. So we have two more presenters. They're both messaging experts who are going to join us. First, I'm going to have a short conversation with Eileen Ariaza. She is executive director of Parents Together, which if you exist on social media, you've probably run into on some platform. I think you guys have like half a million followers on Instagram, um, a huge um, Facebook presence as well, Eileen. And I have loved getting to know you and working together in our advocacy for mainstream parents who are sick of the extremism out there. And I wanted to ask you to come and join us tonight because actually of this issue of how important um, messenger is, not just message. As we, um, these women spoke up as mothers. And can you, as the leader of a group that is dedicated to giving parents voice, speak to why that's not just like a nice to have and how fundamentally important it is in this fight? Yes. Um, thank you so much for having me, um, Katie. And thank you for to the previous speakers. It was so inspiring to hear. Um, I'm Eileen Ariaza, and I'm the executive director at Parents Together. And absolutely, um, the messenger is just as important as the message. And the parent voice is incredibly important right now. So I was really delighted to hear two moms talking or three moms talking about their own personal experience of what they want for their kids. You know, at Parents Together, from the very beginning, we always um, made the choice to speak to parents as a parent, right? Not as an organization, not as a non-real entity, right? Um, and not to talk to them with like stats and talking points and data, because that's not how parents connect. Think about when you, as a mom, when you want advice from someone, or when you have a parenting question, who do you call? You call another mom, right? You call somebody who's been through that, um, and who can help you find an answer from that place of motherhood or fatherhood um, or parenthood. And so having parents speak up right now, it is absolutely crucial. The right, 
at the other side is co-opting parents. Many times they're not even parents themselves who are like selling these messages that are really about creating fear and anxiety. And as parents, we can speak from our from a place of real, our real lived experience and lean into the values that matter to us, which are love and care and wanting to be there for our kids and wanting the best future for our kids. And, you know, we've done lots of message testing around this. And we have found that when we speak to parents as parents from a place of shared values, it works and it outperforms the other side's message all the time. Okay. So Eileen, we have been hearing about parental rights, not just in Ohio and issue one, but it's been now, you know, Trump and DeSantis are doing this in the Republican primary when they talk about public education. And frankly, it seems like just about any issue right now is about parents' rights. Why are they leaning so hard into this? And what are you seeing in terms of the impact that has had on the public education debate? And what is your advice to us to prevent sort of that hijacking of this one? Yeah, this is one of their core strategies right now, right? They are leaning into parents really hard and they see it as an opportunity, right? To really um, exploit parental anxiety, parental fear. A lot of it is, you know, stemming from all the way from COVID, all everything that happened, how, how as parents we felt um, like we didn't, we didn't have answers. Um, there's also so much anxiety that parents have economically, right? Because there's inflation, there's, um, we had the child tax credit, but then that got taken away. We don't have, as parents in this country, we don't have things like basic things that other countries have, like paid leave or affordable childcare. So all of these things are weighing on parents, making it hard for us to parent every day. And the right is exploiting those feelings and trying to tap into this fear and anxiety to scare parents. Um, and so it's happening in schools. They're trying to create division between parents and teachers, between parents and parents. Um, and it is absolutely a strategy that they're using to, to, to sow confusion and division, just like it's the same, it's the same playbook as, as with, um, as in Ohio. And so what we have what we know is that the vast majority of parents don't agree with this. The, the, the data tells us that, the polls tell us that, that the vast majority of parents don't agree with the attacks on education um, and they want their kids to have the freedom to learn. Um, and what we need is for parents to speak up as parents. And honestly, a lot of what the right is using is... Um, is these wedge issues, right? Like trans kids and uh, yeah. saying, talking about race and CRT and all this stuff. Um, and often we we feel like, okay, we have to go on defense and 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 respond to these things. Honestly, we have a much better story, an, an offensive story to tell about what the future, what we imagine for our kids and what's possible and what we can be doing to create um, a different world. We don't have to like, play by their rules, respond to their nonsense. We can paint a different and new picture where parents, kids have freedom to learn, kids have freedom, autonomy over, over their bodies, where families can afford to take care of their kids, um, where they have paid leave and the child tax credit and affordable childcare, all of these things, that, which are the things that matter to us as parents. They are the things that affect us every day. So, um, that's um, how we are encouraging folks to talk about it. And again, to to lean into the values of love and care. They want to use hate and fear and division. We, because no, there's there's nothing more powerful and transformative than the love parents have for their kids. Like we know this, all parents know this. And so let's lean into that and use that value to to bring us together. And I'm convinced that it can outperform their anxiety and fear strategy. Yes. Okay, Eileen, this is a hundred, not only am I just, feel, I'm like nodding my head like so hard it might come off, but thank you because this is also just the perfect transition now to um, bring on Jess McIntosh. So Eileen, you have, you have done your job. Thank you so much <laughs> for affirming the importance of this message of the messenger 
and just like firing me up anyway to completely lean in. Okay. And to do it in a way that's offensive for our values. And that is what Miss Jess McIntosh is the absolute expert in. I'm so glad you're here tonight, Jess. So let me bring you up and I'm, and we can take me down in just a moment. Jess McIntosh, fan favorite here at Red, Wine and Blue for helping us bust disinformation and figure out how to play offense on disinformation. So we're not just repeating their garbage and instead responding in ways that are effective and keeping the debate on our own terms. So um, here we go, Jess. It's all you. I'm so excited to be here. It's been so amazing to listen to all of these conversations. And I just get like nodding so hard your head's going to fall off. Like, yes, yes. Like everything you're saying, I want to get in the chat. Anyway. I'm going to keep this as short as possible so we can get to Q&A, but this is the operationalization of everything that you have heard up until now. So we're going to start here. The first step <laughs> to combating the disinformation is don't ignore it. Like We're going to talk to you a lot about how not to repeat it, how not to get caught up in that, but it's okay to acknowledge that it is happening. Frankly, it's kind of weird that people are getting lied to. That is an awkward thing to deal with as an adult that doesn't usually happen in our lives. And it is happening here. So go ahead and say it. There is a lot of bad information out there. We want to set the record straight. That is actually a great way to open up a conversation with somebody who has heard something that is concerning. There is a lot of bad information out there. Notice how that acknowledges the disinformation without repeating any of it. The truth is, it's okay to get into this. It's okay to say what's happening. Some outside groups and politicians are heavily invested in confusing and scaring parents to score political points, but we believe our kids are more important than politics. The truth is, they wouldn't be resorting to these disinformation tactics if they could win on their merits. Unfortunately, they, they can't for them. I, I mean, you don't get to the numbers that support reproductive freedom without Republican women, without independent women, without religious women, without women in red states and blue states. They know that the numbers are simply not on their side. That is why they are doing what they are doing. And it is okay to name that. We can go to the next slide. This is the only one that it, that requires uh, that that little mental that little mental jump because it is totally counterintuitive. You want if somebody says is something terrible happening, you want to go that terrible thing's not happening, and that is not what's going to happen here. Those kinds of statements, like the one I have up here, are actually counterproductive. They're true. They're totally factual, but they're counterproductive anyway. It's great fun, and here's why. It's for two reasons. One, the way the human brain works is that. After you say over and over again that X is not Y, after a couple of weeks, sure, you know that X isn't Y, but also X and Y now live in the same folder of your brain. You now think there's something about X and Y that go together. And that's how it works, especially for folks who are not zeroed in, paying tons of attention. They're just hearing it as background noise. Don't add to it. The second reason, and this is actually way more important, is that we don't use our time saying the things we want to say, right? If you have a five minute conversation with somebody and all you do is argue that X is not actually Y, you haven't said all of the good things about issue one that you want to say. You haven't told your personal story. You haven't said why you support it. You haven't talked about reproductive freedom and what that means for you. You haven't shown up as a parent. You've simply had the debate that frankly, they want you to have. A lot of this is not really about convincing people that X is Y or that issue one does some of the things they say it's, it's there to do. What it is is about taking up the time and the oxygen away from what's true and making sure you spend your time debating what they want you to debate. So that is how we ground ourselves and like, no, we are not going to play that game. So the way that looks for real, because it's easy to get it in theory, but in practice, it's tougher, is we can go to the next slide. Well, you'll, you'll see an example. I call this the power of no. You can answer the disinformation with no. Or, or like I said before, with, oh, there's so much bad information out there. You can say, that's not true. You can say, I've actually heard the opposite. You can say, and there are so many ways to bat something down without following it down the, the debate path. So, here you go. The question on everybody's mind, does issue one change Ohio's parental consent laws? The answer is no. See how, it, look, I deal with it just like that. Politicians in Columbus took away parents' rights when they passed Ohio's six-week abortion ban. So see what we've done here? We have said no, we have dealt with it, and then we're talking about the true facts. 
In fact, Ohio, Ohio's parents have more rights with issue one. These are the people who try to take it away with the abortion ban. So issue one strengthens all of our parental rights by putting the healthcare decisions back in the hands of Ohio families instead of the government. So see how we say no. And then by the end of it, we are saying the things we want to say. This is about you making the decision for your family. This is about your kids. This is not about the government. We can move on to the next slide because we're going to do this with a few of the things that you might have you might have heard. How does issue one impact transgender health care for minors? This is one of the biggest pieces of disinformation that comes out there. So it is OK to say the amendment has absolutely nothing to do with gender affirming health care and it doesn't mention it. Remember, in Ohio, minors actually have to have parental permission before any medical procedure, including gender affirming care. But we're not going to stop there. So we have knocked down the disinformation, but we are not going to end on that period. We are going to say why they have heard the opposite. And the truth is that some politicians and outside groups want to confuse and scare them because they know that Ohio women want reproductive freedom. We can't be fooled. So you're going you're gonna to deal with the disinformation. And then again, you're going to move on to the things you actually want to say, because that is where the conversation gets productive. OK, we can go to the next one. Which I yes, which is about issue one allowing for late term abortions in Ohio. This one is a little bit different in terms of how we answer it, and you will probably recognize it from when we talk to, when we talk about abortion. Whenever we talk about abortion, the truth is extremists who want to distract us from their attempts to ban all abortion regularly use this non medical term late term abortion uh, to distract and deceive voters. Let's be clear. And we've already heard this from women who know much better um, than most of the folks you're going to be having the conversation with. Abortions later in a pregnancy are extremely rare and happen because something has gone terribly wrong. It is okay to lean into this story. It is okay to say zero abortions occurred in Ohio after 24 weeks. These are tragedies. These are tragedies where there is a leaf, there, something has gone terribly wrong is really all you need to get into. But obviously there you can explain if you have a personal story with this, this is where you would want to share it. The women who are in these situations desperately need the ability to make decisions with their doctors, not with politicians or the government. Like these are the stories that should be the most sympathetic, especially to somebody who's on the fence about reproductive freedom. These are the ones where it's no, no, these women really, really need the right and ability to do this themselves with their spouses, with, with their religious, with, with whoever they want to bring into this most personal decision and not politicians. So if issue one passes, Patients will be able to make decisions based on their needs, not politics. So lean right into this. Like, we don't have to deal with the late term abortion language. What we are going to do is explain what abortions that happen later in a pregnancy really are. Something has gone terribly wrong. They deserve our sympathy and they deserve to have their rights. We can move on. I get really worked up about that one. It just always. Whew. Okay. This one is my favorite. I'm just confused. <laughs> like, what does voting yes versus voting no mean? Pretend that this one also has the like, what about the ballot language versus the amendment language? There is a lot of confusing stuff out there. So start by saying that you're confused for a reason. Like, let people know that it's not their fault that they're confused. This is incredibly difficult to follow. And that is on purpose. Extremist groups and politicians know you're gonna, I mean, I'm repeating myself. I'm repeating myself because I want you all to repeat yourself. Extremist politicians know that the majority of Ohioans support access to abortion. And so they are trying to confuse us by distorting facts. They want voters to reject the amendment so that all abortions will be banned in Ohio. Voting yes will stop the abortion ban. So, so you're gonna you're gonna valid. I mean, it's important to validate where people are, and if they are confused, if they are lost, let them know that that is not their fault. It is weird to think like politicians are trying to confuse me, but they are. Here we are. So this is why relational organizing matters so so much. Is that the the thing that the the people who we trust are the people who we trust more than any experts, more than any pundits, more than any politician, more than any commercial. Your friends trust you. So when you meet them where they are, talk to them about their concerns, and then give them the facts, that is the most effective thing you can do. We can go to the last slide. Because uh, this is just basically our, our recap. So keep in mind, you can ask questions. There's so much bad info out there. What is it you're concerned about? 
not everybody is ready to jump in with the, I heard X, Y, and Z, and I'm terrified. But if you are having that conversation with someone who's on the fence, go ahead and invite the conversation. The facts are on our side. The issue is on our side. People are on our side. It's okay to have this conversation. We really need to have this conversation in the next couple of weeks. So you're going to ask, you're going to start it. There's so much bad information out there. What is it you're concerned about? And then remember, say, no, that isn't true. I've heard otherwise. Whatever your own spin on like, I don't think so. And then move on to the facts. Two, you're going to find common ground. You probably share the concern of the person that you are talking to. Disinformation works because it does scare and confuse some people. So you're probably talking to somebody who is relatively pro-choice, somebody who believes that, certainly believes that women should be making, you know, the vast majority of healthcare decisions by themselves and, and probably can't stand abortion bans because only like six, 7% of the country actually want total abortion bans. So your point is you're probably talking to somebody who is more or less in agreement with you on this issue but has heard something that is concerning because that's how the disinformation campaign works. So meet their concern. If they're concerned about their, their kids uh, doing things that they don't know about, meet that concern. You might even share it. You know, if they're, if they're concerned about, uh, about, about uh, whether people are going to understand this, so the ballot language is too confusing, meet their concern, you share it. Um, and then we pivot, we meet their concern. I'm concerned about my kids not telling me things too. That's why. I'm going to vote yes on issue one. I'm concerned about my kids having rights. That's why I'm going to vote yes on issue one. I am very concerned about the reproductive decisions of Ohio families being made within the houses of Ohio families. That's why I'm going to vote yes on issue one. Um, and then go ahead and acknowledge the bad actors. There are a lot of people trying to confuse their parents. Our kids are worth more than politics. So that is my mini disinfo training just for you all in Ohio. Thank you so, so much um, for doing what you're doing and, and for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. And I have written down the questions. The number one question, of course, is where can I get these talking points? I'm asking <laughs> people, are you feeling confident? People are saying, yeah, okay. I think I'm feeling more confident. I think I'm feeling more confident. I would feel more confident if I had access to these uh, to this language. And so I have dropped several times while Jess was speaking, others will too, um, a link to um, restoreohio.com or it's a red wine, uh, red wine and blue link, you know, slash restore row. Um, if you go there, there's an FAQ section. It has all of this and even a few more. Okay. We wanted to hit sort of the big highlights. We know that we're hearing from you all over and over again, that you wanted to make sure that you could address. Um, and what you can do is look at these and then bring together that inspiration that we heard of like knowing that your voice, and if you're not, um, you know, a, a parent, maybe you're a grandparent, maybe you're a godparent, maybe you're an aunt or an uncle, you know, I mean, there are so many ways to own your voice in this, get grounded in that and think about how you feel comfortable, you know, talking about these things, saying these things. I love all the just pivots. Actually, I've heard the opposite. Oh yeah, I can I hear you on that. What what is your concern there? Oh yeah, I feel that way too, you know, thinking about this as a mom or yeah, I could see why there's confusion. And then you bring clarity. It soothes, bring that soothing friendship, that clarity, you know, to those conversations. And see what, you know, what I've actually found is that many people actually have confusion who are totally with us, but it makes them ambivalent in spreading the word. So yeah, maybe they're going to go vote yes, but they're a little bit worried. What sort of hornet's nest am I going to get into if I bring this up or someone else brings up misinformation? I'd rather just walk on by. Whereas instead, if we can make them feel confident, all of a sudden they are tripling their vote and even more. And that's what we need. Okay. So the most effective way to get this information out is to join us in our friend to friend, family to family, mobilizing your network, because these are the people who trust you. And that's the best way to the, the trifecta here is good information combined with good messenger and you owning your voice in terms of who you are combined with you talking to the people you know that is just like the you know the perfect way to communicate with people to build that trust and enthusiasm for issue one that we have got to have to get us across the finish line so the way to do that jen do you want to um bring up um like i'm just going to show you guys some quick data um to reiterate the point that this is the most effective way to influence others. Okay, Red, White, and Blue did this 
turnout, this approach to GOTV, to voter turnout in 2022 in the midterms. This is in Ohio. Among the people that volunteers contacted, so that's anyone that you would take responsibility for contacting to say, hey, I learned some interesting things that were really helpful to me to learn about issue one. Um, check it out. And we, what we found is that we increased turnout among the people that we contacted for our program. And by we, I mean you, by eight and a half percent. That is a, approximately 50 times more than any form of traditional voter contact. Again, because it's this magic approach of talking to the people you know. And please, 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 I promise you, not everyone you know is definitely planning to vote. So we need to make sure that they not only vote, but they're fired up about it. This off year, off year, odd year election. Okay. And we also even found that people who became volunteers, so maybe again, those people who are kind of like, eh, I'll vote yes, they get fired up about this. What we found is that among volunteers themselves, we saw an increase in turnout. This is comparing 2018 to 22 to over of over 13%. And the really cool part about this too is that many of you, most of you actually live in very purple places and some red places too. And that means that you have networks that are filled with these independent, unaffiliated Republican voters who are otherwise with us on the issue. But again, they are being targeted by this disinformation. So we need to show up for them. And what we found by looking at who you all reached in 2022 is that we did see that you were cutting through partisan lines, getting beyond the choir, and bringing these people along with you, converting many of them even to becoming volunteers alongside you, which is so exciting. So to be a part of this, and many of you already are, if you are already a part of this and you already have an account on Rally, which is how you join our team, Rally is just the name of the web uh, platform that we use to coordinate all of our activity among each other. It's kind of like if you don't log it in Rally, it's like almost like it didn't exist because we want to know what, what happens here together and the impact we can have. And using Rally makes your outreach exponentially more powerful because you go on there and you say, okay, I'm taking responsibility for Jen and Amy and, uh, and Eileen. You are going to be matching these folks to the voter file. So you're going to be getting information about them that's publicly available, but just like if they've been voting in recent elections, that helps inform your conversations. We also have actions in there and the, and the number one action in there right now, which is so important, is we have language ready to go for you of what you can just copy and paste into Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, text apps to start the conversation about this in an easy way. And obviously you can adapt the language to your voice, but we make this super conversational. We've got the link right there that drives them straight to the FAQ page. Um, so everything is right there for you. We're also working on school board races and that is really hard to research. Sometimes people have no idea what's going on at that local of a level. So we're providing targeted information on specific school board races in places in Ohio where there are extremists on the ballot that we need to make sure don't win. Okay. So yes, all of this information is available. I got to catch up on messages here. I want to answer a few of these questions. First of all, just to reiterate, because I think that these are important for everyone. It, folks were asking, saying, is it true that many fetal anomalies are not discovered until 20 weeks? And our, our doctors actually who are on the panel um, did indeed answer that affirmatively. And it's just completely discounted in this debate. This, this also points the really important um, point that Jess made in the language she provided in terms of responding on late-term abortion. Like, let's be real. And I have found when this comes up in conversations, it takes it out of the talking point territory. They immediately realize, oh, I was just told a thing, but you're actually talking to me about life experiences. And it even usually rings a bell of like something that happened with someone that they know. And all of a sudden you are on a totally different turf. And that turf is one in which they're going to be very willing to support this ballot initiative. Um, someone asked if Kansas was different than Ohio. Um, so reproductive freedom is six for six in America so far. Some of these ballot initiatives, when it's been on the ballot, some of these ballot initiatives have been affirmative of reproductive rights, like Ohio's. We are trying to put this in our constitution to protect reproductive rights. In Kansas, they were actually saying no 
to something. So um, anti-abortion extremists were putting something very extreme, taking advantage of the post Roe v. Wade environment to make their laws even more strict than they already were. And Kansas said no to that. So yeah, it was a very different situation. Um, but anytime it's been on the ballot, whether whether affirming reproductive rights means saying yes or no, the affirmative position for reproductive rights has won every time so far. Um, and then people were asking, are they really coming for contraception? Unfortunately, yes, there are uh, multiple Ohio State represent representatives on the record saying that they um, are interested in coming after contraception next. There are also many co-sponsors in the Ohio House of legislation that would say, um, basically define um, life beginning at conception, which um, could could make IUDs immediately illegal. So there's that. Um, so yes, contraception in Ohio is very, very, very much threatened. Um, I wanted to um, also, there was one other thing I wanted to make sure we addressed here. Um, oh, what about the anti-abortion position or stance of Catholics? Okay, um, we are actually going to be having an event. Amy and Jen have been planning, and it is a faith and reproductive rights event where we are going to be having um, both Catholic and other uh, representatives of other faiths. Actually, the pastor who appears in the Pro Issue One um, ad that you probably all have seen on TV, he's going to be with us speaking about the interesting experience he has had in using his voice in such a public way. Um, that is coming up. Amy, do you want to pop in and share any when that's happening? Sorry, I was like frantically typing away. Uh, yes, that is going to be the 23rd. It is at 730 as well. We are really excited to have this conversation in the intersection of faith and reproductive rights. So uh, please join us for that. It's going to be a great conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Jen, I'm, drop the link. Person, I'm looking forward to it as a person of faith um, who, you know, fully supports and believes in reproductive um, rights. There's no inconsistency here. And I'm looking forward to sharing in that conversation with these faith leaders. Um, are there other questions? How is IVF affected by the current ban and how can we explain it would be protected by um, voting yes? Um, I feel like I would love for Samantha or um, who would be best suited among our experts, Amy, to speak to this. It's so important. You could speak to it too, actually. <laughs> I don't want to put Dr. Wigan on the, in the on the spot if uh, she's not comfortable. IVF is affected. Are you comfortable, Dr. Wigan, or do you want me to try to answer it? Well, I'm certainly no expert in this, but I think it has something to do with the status of the embryos. Yeah, so I can speak a little bit to this. Um, I went through IVF. Um, my embryos were created and stored in the state of Texas as my husband was stationed there. Um, after the Dobbs decision came out, I decided that I probably didn't want to keep my embryos in Texas anymore because they had trigger laws um, on the books for creating personhood language to give embryos um, status of personhood and basically like legal citizenship type of an idea. I'm not a legal scholar, so please don't quote me completely on that. Um, and what that does is that it, they are trying to create regulation around the use of embryos. And so, you know, nobody has really come out with specifics. Um, there is definitely pause and concern regarding the use of embryos when it comes to anti-choice um, groups and legislation. And so I had a hard time getting my embryos out of Texas um, and certain institutions wouldn't take them on because they feared litigation um, being considered a Texas person. Uh, and so protecting reproductive rights, and that's what's so beautiful about issue one, is it, it protects the spectrum of reproductive rights from abortion all the way to contraception, the right to stay pregnant and IVF, so that no one can come in, politicians can't come in and tell you what you can and cannot do with your embryos, with their reproductive life, and when and how you start a family. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Ultimately, you know, this all comes back 
to how varied every single woman's different life experiences around reproductive health care. Um, whether it is, you know, Amy had her IVF journey, you know, I mean, I can't think of how many women I know who have um, shared, shared those with me, very close friends. And every single person's story is different and complicated and hard, just as um, people's stories are with all aspects of reproductive health care. And I think that what I have learned more than anything since Roe v. Wade was overturned, you know, we experienced in red, white, and blue across all of our communities here within our Ohio community and all across the country, thousands of women sharing personal stories about abortion and about other reproductive health care decisions that they just couldn't imagine not being their own. And I learned of personal circumstances that I had never heard of before. You know, I thought I was pretty educated on this issue. I thought I, you know, I've talked with various friends and people in my lives about different experiences, but there were countless circumstances that I had never heard of before. And so it just made me realize how the importance more than ever of this decision being each person's own. And so, you know, and, and until I, I can't, I can't, I can't walk in your shoes. Right. And you can't actually walk in mine. All we can do is support each other. And that is what issue one does is provides that basic support that we all need to be able to make these decisions with our families and with our doctors and not have politicians and government intervene. So I think it's true just across the board. And this amendment was written beautifully by physicians and legal experts to provide that comprehensive um, protection. It is so frustrating that they have distorted that Frank LaRose, our secretary of state and the partisan ballot board um, have distorted the language. That is all the more reason why it's so important that we are so clear with everyone that we know about what this amendment does, which was again written by legal and medical experts to provide exactly the kind of support that Ohioans need to make their, their own personal decisions. So we know the majority is with us. My hope tonight is that you all have gained some confidence because again, it's not just like, okay, maybe all right, sort of I could dip my toe. We need you confident out there. We need you going over to rally, entering. I challenge you to enter at least 10 more people tonight or start your account and get those first 10 in tonight. We need to put up big numbers. This is how we win. It is contacting the people that we know, busting through these, you know, disinformation bubbles and recognizing that it's not just people who are hanging out on, you know, QAnon and whatever. It's this disinformation, it really impacts a lot of people. And it can just, it, it can be the difference between someone, okay, I'll vote yes. And again, ducking that conversation and being the full-throated advocate that we need and among all of our people right now. So um, if there is anything that we didn't get to, we will save the chat. You can also email us at um, ohio at redwine.blue with anything you need. I want to be respectful of everyone's time tonight. It is absolutely incredible to me that over 150 people, I think we had, you know, joined us on a Monday night. You guys just blow me away again and again. Um, but um, we will continue to be here for you. We are a team here in Ohio. Red, wine, and blue started in Ohio. We will always be Ohio. And it is all of you here tonight that make this community so special. So um, we've got your back and um, let's keep doing this together. Thank you guys so much for tonight. Thanks everybody. Let's go. Thank you all.